Okay, so welcome to this uh, next video in which we are discussing um, HER2 amplifications and uh, how it can lead to uh, breast cancer. Okay, so at the moment we're discussing uh, the uh, mechanistic target of rapamycin complex 1. Okay, so the mechanistic target of rapamycin complex 1 consists of the protein mTOR itself, the mechanistic target of rapamycin, along with a bunch of accessory proteins, such as raptor, which is the regulatory associated protein of mTOR, and also a protein known as MLST8. Okay, so let me put this here. MLST8. Okay, uh, which stands for mammalian lethal with SEC13 protein 8. So MLST8, which I'll write over here, stands for mammalian lethal, mammalian lethal with SEC13 protein 8. Okay, SEC13 protein 8. God only knows why it's called that. Um, MLST8. Okay, so the mammalian lethal with SEC13 protein 8. We'll colour that in some dangerous colour then. Um, it'll have to be uh, maybe orange. We'll have it in orange. So MLST8 here, the, mammalia, uh, the um, mammalian lethal with SEC13 protein 8. Okay, uh, and then finally, another protein known as Deptor down here, uh, which stands for domain containing mTOR interacting protein. So, Deptor, domain containing uh, mTOR interacting protein. So, we'll write its name over here as well. So, Deptor. Okay, so Deptor stands for domain containing, domain containing mTOR interacting protein. Okay, right. So, uh, there's one final protein which um, forms part of this mTOR uh, complex 1, uh, which is the protein PRAS40. Now, PRAS40 binds uh, to the protein RAPTOR, so we'll draw it over here. So, this is PRAS40 bound off uh, the Raptor protein here, PRAS40 over here. Right, okay, so let me just colour in these proteins. So we'll have Deptor, this domain-containing mTOR interacting protein over here, and finally we'll have, uh, well, we'll have that in green, and we'll have, um, we will have in turquoise, we'll have PRAS40. Okay, so here now is the structure of this entire um, mTOR complex 1 now. Right. Now, the aim of AKT is to try and activate this mTOR complex 1 because this mTOR complex 1 is what's going to then cause the cell to divide when it's active. Excuse me. Right, so let's try and see the linking between AKT becoming active and mTORC1 um, becoming active. Right, okay, so there are two pathways. Now, firstly, um, well, uh, maybe not firstly, because maybe it's not as important, but uh, we will put firstly, because it's the easier of the two, that AKT phosphorylates this PRAS40 protein here. So it phosphorylates PRAS40, and when it phosphorylates PRAS40, PRAS40 then falls off the Raptor uh, protein, basically. And when PRAS40 falls off the Raptor protein, then that activates the mTORC1, or com uh, well, the mTORC1. So the m mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1 becomes active when the PRAS40 Unbinds, cleaves off from Raptor, basically. And AKT, down here, uh, is responsible for phosphorylating PRAS40 and causing this cleaving off of the, of the PRAS40 protein from Raptor. Okay, now another thing uh, that AKT does 
is it inactivates something known as the tuberous sclerosis complex 2 protein. Okay, so I need to explain to you what the tuberous sclerosis complex is. So the tuberous sclerosis complex is a complex of two proteins, TSC2, which stands for tuberous sclerosis complex 2 protein, and TSC1, which stands for the tuberous sclerosis complex 1 protein. So these together are the tuberous, tuberous sclerosis complex. Okay, and their role, basically, is as a GTPase. Well, specifically, TS2, this tuberous sclerosis complex 2, it is a GTPase, which will hydrolyze GTP to GDP when it has the tuberous sclerosis complex 1 bound to it. Okay, right, so the, the specific... Um, GTPase reaction, which is important here, is that TSC, the tuberous sclerosis complex 2 protein, will um, cleave uh, the GDP molecule of a protein known as REB. So REB basically is like an on-off switch protein, uh, which, um, well, it's a monomeric G protein, which, when it's in the off state, will have GDP bound to it, basically. Okay, and when it's in the on state, it will have GTP bound to it. Now, basically, the tuberous sclerosis complex protein 2 will hydrolyze the GTP bound to REB to GDP and therefore inactivate this REB protein. So, REB is going to be inactivated usually by the tuberous sclerosis complex 2. Uh, protein when it's active, which is when it's bound to the tuberous sclerosis complex 1. Okay, right. Now, um, basically, what protein kinase B does, or AKT does, is it phosphorylates the uh, tuberous sclerosis complex 2 protein, so this TSC2 protein, and when it phosphorylates it, what happens is TSC2 now associates with a protein known as 14 free free. Okay, so protein kinase B phosphorylates the tuberous sclerosis complex protein 2, this TSC2 protein here. And when it does, uh, the tuberous sclerosis complex 2 now becomes a uh, high affinity for this protein 14 free free. Okay, so that's the name of a protein, believe it or not. So 1433 comes and binds to the tuberous sclerosis complex with this phosphate group on. And now the tuberous sclerosis complex um, protein 2 cannot bind with the tuberous sclerosis complex 1 protein. So um, you can't form the tuberous sclerosis complex. And when tuberous sclerosis complex 2 protein is not bound with tuberous sclerosis complex 1 protein, it doesn't catalyze this um, hydrolysis of the GTP bound to the REB protein. So what's going to happen is REB GTP is going to go up within the cell, basically. So REB is going to be very happy. It's not having its GTP hydrolyzed anymore because tuberous, tuberous sclerosis complex 2 protein is inactive now. And then what happens is this REB uh, GTP molecule somehow, by unknown mechanisms, um, activates the mTORC1, basically, the mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1. And now this mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1 is going to do the same thing uh, as... Um, the uh, MYC transcription factors and as the CFOS and CGUN transcription factors, i.e. it's going to promote you moving from the interphase of the cell cycle to the G1 phase. So here is the mechanistic target of rapamycin complex 1. Okay, right. So overall then, when one of your uh, cells one of, one, one of the epithelial cells in the uh, breast uh, gets this amplification of HER2. It's going to overactivate both the um, MAP kinase ERK pathway 
and both the and the um, PI free kinase AKT mTOR mTOR pathway. Those pathways becoming overactive are going to lead to that cell dividing far too rapidly. So if we go back to our initial picture of the breast, wherever that was, um, where did I put the initial picture of the breast? Ah, here it is. So if we go back to our initial picture of the breast, when this cell gets this amplification, what's going to happen is it's going to divide far too much. So you're going to get a whole bunch of cells which all have this mutation in basically all have the amplification of HER2 because basically once that original cell gets that mutation it's going to divide far too much and all of its offspring cells this entire population are all genetically identical to it so it makes a whole population of cells which all have um, all have this HER2 amplification now at the moment this is not cancer yet this is what we would call a benign tumour at the moment. All the, the only problem it's got, basically, is it's got an oncogene, a single oncogene. It's get, got a gain of function mutation in HER2. So this would be a benign tumour. The problem is benign tumours are a breeding ground for malignant tumours, basically, for cancer. Um, because you have this entire huge, great population of cells, the just by probability and chance, one of them may acquire another mutation, another mutation that is significant. I mean, mutations will be happening in all of them. Mutations are very, very common. If you go out and lie on a beach in the sun for a day, uh, you will suffer 60 million mutations, is a statistic that I remember somehow. Um, but um, I don't know how they work that out. But um, the point is, mutations are not uncommon. So there will be mutations happening within this population of cells which all have this HER2 amplification. Most of them will cause, you know, fatal problems. You know, they might cause complex 4 to become defunctional and that will kill the cell, uh, just like cyanide would. But some of them might just allow it to divide even more rapidly or might allow it to uh, start producing, well, might allow it to uh, get a mutation that makes it genetically unstable, such as a p53 knockout. Uh, if you lose both p53 genes, then all of your daughter cells will become genetically unstable. They'll gain mutations like wildfire because p53 is responsible for uh, preventing mutations in uh, the DNA from, um, well, from remaining basically it's involved in the repair pathways um, so basically what's going to happen is this is just the start this is a breeding ground where you can get more mutations and you can get cells that are gradually moving along the pathway towards cancer so they'll you'll get another cell so let me show this you'll get another cell in here that might just get some other mutations so I'll show this in green so this green cell has acquired another mutation, basically, on top of the HER2 amplification that now allows it to divide even more rapidly. So it will produce a whole population of cells genetically identical to it, um, which all have not only the HER2 amplification, but also uh, this second mutation, which allows it to divide even more rapidly then in this green population one of those cells might get a mutation in p53 which then means that it becomes genetically unstable it can't repair uh, dna damage anymore so let's say this is this blue cell it will then produce a whole population of cells that are genetically identical to it firstly because it had the green mutation and it had the HER2 amplification, so it's going to divide very, very rapidly and produce a whole population of cells which are all genetically unstable. And in this blue population of cells, you've now got um, loads of cells that are undergoing mutations like wildfire. And in that population, one of them might then get mutate. Well, some of them might now get mutations that allow them to invade and destroy uh, the healthy tissue of the breast. So they might start invading the healthy tissue of the breast like so.
Okay, and that's when it becomes cancer. So remember the hallmarks of cancer. The first hallmark of cancer is that you need to have oncogenes, i.e. over division, over proliferation. Second hallmark of cancer, you need um, a loss of function of the tumor suppressor genes, which also leads to over division. Third hallmark of cancer, you need replicative in the mortality. Your telomeres need to um, uh, continue lengthening themselves so that you don't have a hay thick limit, so you need activation of the telomerase enzyme. Fourth hallmark of cancer, you need angiogenesis. Fifth hallmark of cancer, you need resistance to apoptotic mechanisms. Sixth mark, hallmark of cancer, and potentially the most important, you need to be invasive and metastatic, so you need to be actually actively destroying the healthy tissue, like I'm drawing here, basically. Okay, and then if it invades in on the blood vessel, uh, then it will chuck tumorous, uh, cancerous cells into the blood, and those can get lodged in other places in the body and set up secondary tumors, i.e. lead to metastasis. So that's how uh, getting this HER2 amplification is going to uh, set you on the way. It's going to create you this breeding ground, basically, where all you need is... Um, what you're waiting for, basically, is just one of those cells in that population to then get another mutation that then uh, takes it further along the way to uh, becoming cancer. It'll then produce a population of cells uh, identical to it, and then in one of those, you'll continue the process on again until finally you get to something that has the hallmarks of cancer.